Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part eight of my UML2 video tutorial. Today, we're going to talk about state machine and package diagrams and pretty much wrap up the meat of all the syntax behind creating UML system models. Now, state machine diagrams model the changing states of objects and the events that cause these state changes. And a state diagram is going to show many different things as we go through here. But what I got here on the screen is going to show states and transitions. And this whole entire image and everything can be used as a cheat sheet, and it's available underneath the video in a link. Now, transitions, which is what these guys are, these arrows here, going backwards and forwards, are going to represent how states change. And this is a state, has card, and this is another state, no card. And I'm using my common ATM sort of thing to diagram all this stuff. Now the events that occur, like eject card and card entered, are going to trigger state changes. And these events are going to be written across the transition arrows. Now states and transitions are often listed in a table format, like you see here. And you're just going to list state and trigger. And then across the top, you're going to list your events. And then you're going to show how the individual events are going to change the individual states. Just as you can see here, no card. Now, if a card is entered, it is then going to change to the new state, which is going to be has card. So if you prefer to list them in table form, you can do that. However, that is not quite so common. And state diagrams are normally going to have an initial state, like you can see here, and this is how you would document that, as well as a final state. And you're going to be able to document behaviors that occur whenever you are currently in a state by just listing do with a little slash and then document exactly what is going on while your system is in the state called verify funds. It is going to be verifying checking funds in this situation. And this is referred to as a do behavior. Now transition arrows can be a lot more complicated. Like I said before, they can have descriptions and these descriptions can be quite verbose. And you can also see here that we can self call our states just by drawing arrows like we have done in previous UML diagrams. And basically, with these transitions that we are going to be documenting here, we're going to first list a trigger, and that trigger is going to be the thing that moves us from the request fund state to the process request state. So that's the very first thing you're going to list. Then you're going to list a guard statement, and the guard is going to be a Boolean condition of some sort or other that either allows or blocks a transition. So you can see here, if the requested funds are less than or equal to the funds available, it's going to then move on to process the request. However, if the request for funds is greater than funds available, it's going to say, nah, we can't do that. And it's going to again ask them to request the funds that they want. And then finally, you're going to have the transitional behavior. And this is going to be the behavior that occurs as you transition to the next state. And things like passing values for processing and so forth are listed in this situation. So what we're doing here is passing the actual request in a amount that the user is asking for. And then that is going to be processed over here in this current state. And then you're going to come to your final state right here after the request has been processed. So that's kind of a complicated transitional arrow. And then this is a couple other examples of different state machine diagrams you can have here. You could also just put in card valid, and this is either going to come back as true or false. And if it would come back in false in this situation, that's where you would come back and request again another card and then verify the funds inside of the state description. And then this is what you're going to be asking for, ask for valid card. However, if the pin was entered and the card was verified, we would come down here and verify that the card and the pin that was entered properly and so forth and so on until we finally get down to request funds and process the request. And another state machine diagram would be this guy right here, which is a little bit more complicated. Here's the initial state point. And then we're going to get to this part here and we're going to ask are funds available. And this is going to make a request. If the request is less than or equal to funds available, then we're going to come over here and provide the funds. Then at that point, 
if funds available is less than or equal to zero, we're going to come down here to no funds. But in most situations, you're not going to get less than or equal to because of this guy up here. And if funds available is greater than or equal to zero in this situation, it's going to hit this state and then bounce back over to the funds available state. So you can see how you can bounce around and then finally refuse the transaction altogether if the request is greater than funds available. So this is just another way that you can document a state machine diagram and lay everything out. It's kind of flexible, but basically you're just using state transition arrows, transition descriptions, and in some situations you're also going to have state do behaviors like I said before. Now there's other types of state internal behavior as we scroll around here and that is just simply called state internal behavior and in this situation we're going to put both an entry point which is what's going to happen when we reach this verify card state. We're going to receive the card and then we're going to check if the card is valid and then after we have checked if the card is valid we're going to put an exit statement inside of here. All these things are going to be handled inside of the state. You don't want anything in here as an internal behavior that's going to occur in any way outside of the state. You're going to inform the customer in this situation whether the card is verified or not. And then you have internal transitions and these are going to cause something to happen. But they do not, just like these guys up here, change or force the user to leave the state itself. You always want to use transitions to leave the state. These guys here are going to be actions that are performed whenever you are currently in the state. So in this situation, we're going to tell the customer if the card is valid or not. And again, we're going to use the same format, trigger, which the trigger in this situation would be, we found out that the card is either valid or invalid. And in this situation, this would be the guard behavior, which is either to come back as true or false and then we're going to tell the customer whether the card is valid or not so that's an example of an internal transition and you can see that over here internal transitions trigger guard and behavior exactly the same format as you use with transition arrows and then you have what are called composite states and they're going to occur whenever you have two or more states that are active at one time and each of these composite states are called substates as you can see labeled right there and in this situation you're going to call this guy verify card and in this situation let's say we wanted to verify the card as well as verify the pin at the same time which is definitely something that could occur well we're going to have a transition arrow coming in here and these two substates are going to be divided into regions using a dashed line just like that and then inside of here we're also going to have two totally different do behaviors occurring this one's going to be verifying the card itself and this is going to be verifying the pin and then after those two are done we're then going to come down here and put card validated to transition to the next point point. and you could also draw two arrows out of here and then fork them together into one arrow if you'd prefer to do that and you could also do the same exact thing where we're also going to have a fork that is going to fork into these two guys if you don't want to use just one arrow. Either way, it's completely up to you. Then we're going to have choice facado states, and they're going to be used whenever a Boolean condition is going to determine the transition that takes place. So here, what we're doing is verifying the card, and this is the guy that represents the Boolean condition that's going to transition to this transition or this transition, depending on if the card is valid or not. So if the card is not valid, that comes back as true, and that's going to send it back here and ask them for another card and in this situation where the card is valid we're then going to come over and verify the pin so that's how you would put in different transitions based off of boolean conditions if you'd like to lay it out that way and then the final thing are diagramming signals again here's initial state so let's just move that out of here and here you're going to represent triggers with either a receive signal icon which is what this guy is pin entered and then represent transition behavior with a send signal which is this one account information request. So they're going to come in here. Your system's going to be in the state of request pin. A pin is going to be entered, which this is going to represent a trigger or receive icon signal, whatever you want to call it. Then we're going to come down here, and if the pin's valid, we're then going to move on to our send signal, which means that information is then going to be sending to this transition state, which is request account type. And for the most part, that's all you need to know about state machine diagrams. So I'm going to get into more things here as the tutorial goes on, but this is more than the basics. 
Now we get to package diagrams, and this is extremely simplistic, which is the reason why I tacked it on to the end of this tutorial. Packages are going to group similar classes, and I'm sure if you've been programming, you know that. And package diagrams are used to show dependencies between classes, and the symbol for a package is just going to be a simple folder like this. And you can either put the name of the package inside of the folder, or as you see here, you can put it on the tab outside of the folder. And the contents of the package can be drawn directly inside of the package and this would be a class product description that is public which you can see because of the plus sign and this is going to be a private class inside of the package which you can see because there is a negative sign you could also have these classes listed as external to the package just by doing exactly what you see here and of course you could put public or private on there if you wanted to and if you'd like to document that a package is contained inside of a package, like a catalog package may contain another package called product, that's exactly how you would label that. Now, it is very common to document packages with a name, which is called URL in reverse packaging. In this situation, with my website, I would put com, new think tank, and then whatever the package name would be. And this is exactly how you would document that. However, you could also document it in other ways, which is like this, just putting com, two colons, new think tank, two colons, and products inside of there. So there's two different ways to document a URL in reverse package. And then on top of that, you're going to be able to show that a class belongs to a package if you wanted to do that, exactly like this, just listing the class name, and then the package name inside of braces right here. Or you could just put in product, two colons, and product description like we have here. So in this situation, you would put the package name followed by two colons and the class name like that, if that is preferred. It is preferred in this situation that you would actually actually name all of your classes with first the package name followed by the class name just in case you end up having packages with exactly the same class name just to avoid any confusion that might come from that so let's say if we had a product description in a package other than product we would easily be able to tell which class we are actually referring to in that situation and because this comes up a lot just so you know classes in the same package are said to be in or part of the same namespace now if you want to show that one package depends on another package you can draw a dependency arrow to it and there's a couple different types of dependency arrows you can show that one package imports another just simply by listing one package and putting import inside of braces like that and putting a dependency arrow you could also show that one package is going to import a class from another package just by pointing directly at that class and just be aware that whenever you're importing these packages, whether they be individual classes or whole entire packages, you're only going to have access or be able to import those public parts of the package, and you're not going to have access to the other ones. Now, if we would have merge, like we have in this situation, this is going to allow you to merge two packages that are hopefully related into a new package, just like that. And the final way of importing packages, for the most part, the most common way is anyway, is to use the access dependency arrow. And this is going to be used if the imported package should have private visibility. So there is pretty much everything you could ever want to know about package diagrams and state machine diagrams. A lot more real world examples are going to be coming very, very, very soon. So leave any questions or comments below. Otherwise, till next time.